Hello, I'm Alexia, and let me help you to take the fear out of birth with a mix of real-life positive birth stories and birthing experts sharing their wisdom. I'll also be sharing techniques for getting into the fearless birthing mindset. And join the Fearless Mumership community for bonus podcast episodes, access to free birth preparation downloads, and loads more stuff to help you to prepare for a positive birth. Join today at fearfreechildbirth.com. Hello and welcome to the Fear Free Childbirth Podcast. This is me, your host, Alexia Leachman. Thank you so much for joining me today. Now, on today's show, we're talking about self-efficacy in childbirth with Sophie Fletcher, who is the best-selling author of the book, Mindful Hypnobirthing. Now, in a nutshell, self-efficacy is your belief in your ability to perform a task. So obviously today, we're going to be talking about your ability to birth your baby. That's what we're going to be talking about. And what factors will influence your levels of belief in your ability to do that with the most positive outcomes possible. So that's basically what today's chat is all about. But before I dive into that, I have got a few things I want to share with you. My first one is a shout out to Nina. Now, Nina is currently 40 plus three days or something out in Japan battling the Japanese healthcare system who are pressuring, they're pressurising her for an induction. And she's doing a like a fantastic job in standing her ground, staying calm and basically using the best word ever when it comes to inductions, which is this. No, that's all you need to use with inductions, the word no. And she's doing it brilliantly. So I just want to give you a huge round of support from the podcast because it's not easy. It isn't easy. And she's finding also that the healthcare professionals over there are not even talking to her directly about her induction. They're talking to her husband, which must be deeply frustrating. Um, So I think you're doing brilliantly, Nina. Just stick with it. Stay calm. You will be fine. And do keep us posted in the Fear Free Childbirth Facebook group, because that's where she's been sharing her journey. If you are not a member of the Fear Free Childbirth Facebook group, then do come inside, do ask to join and, and you'll be let in. Uh, basically, it's there for you to ask questions. We've got loads of birth professionals within the group that are there to answer your questions. You know, if you just need support, you just have anything you want to know, you know, birth professionals come and join us too. So you can offer your support and expertise to women that seek it out. OK, so that was my shout out for today. Then also, I want to uh, let you know that I'm currently piloting a self-care program for birth professionals. And the reason I'm doing this is because I've been asked for it loads by birth professionals. So I'm currently piloting it with a group of doulas at the moment. Uh, But if you are interested in boosting your levels of self-care, if you're a birth professional that really wants to look after yourself on the emotional side, using the fear clearance technique that I share that mums are using all over the world, then uh, you can come and sign up for the waiting list when I do actually release that later this year. So yeah, we're currently trialling it anyway, and I've already trialled it as all ready and had some great results, but I'm just sort of widening the reach at the moment. So if you are interested in doing self-care as a birth professional, then just come to the Fear Free Childbirth website, head over to the birth worker section and you can sign up for the waiting list right there. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit more about today's episode. Today, I'm going to be speaking to Sophie Fletcher all about self-efficacy. Now, self-efficacy might not be something that you know what it is. Certainly, when she first mentioned self-efficacy to me, I was like, what? What is that? And why is it relevant? Um, But it's a really interesting concept that it's well worth understanding, especially in the context of childbirth. Now, you might remember listening to Sophie because I've had her on the podcast already. She is the author of Mindful Hypnobirthing and she was one of the very first people that I interviewed on the podcast when I first launched it. So, and since then, we've, uh, we were always catching up. And in fact, it was when we were together at the Independent Midwifery Conference here in the UK, we had a stand next to each other that we started talking about self-efficacy. And I thought, hey, I have got to get you on the podcast talking about this because it's absolutely relevant to a fear-free childbirth, which is obviously what this podcast is all about. So basically, self-efficacy is related to your belief in your ability to be able to perform a t- task. So obviously in the context of childbirth is your belief in your ability to be able to cope with it, to be able to do it, to be able to do it on your own and all that, anything that's around that, whether you have, you know, what your confidence levels are, what your fear levels are and whether or not you will seek out help, whether you believe that by doing anything, it will actually help you to improve the outcome, whether or not you have control of the outcome. So this is a really important conversation that I think anybody needs to listen to, but especially if you're pregnant and you're having to give birth, because some of the stuff that Sophie shares is just 
really, well, I, I think it's really, really important once you've got a little bit of an understanding of what influences self-efficacy, so how you can improve your own ability to ha- perform better at the task, how you can boost your own belief levels that you can actually do this. All that is really, really interesting to understand. And the thing about Sophie as well is she loves a bit of evidence. So she talks a lot about some of the evidence that backs this up because there's a lot of evidence around self-efficacy in childbirth. So I'm not going to talk any more about this because Sophie is the expert on it. And that is why I got her on the podcast. So here is the time that I spoke to Sophie all about self-efficacy in childbirth. Hello, Sophie. Welcome back to the Fear Free Childbirth podcast. Hello again. Hello, I know you were one of my very, very first guests. In fact, I interviewed you for the first time before I decided to do this podcast. So it's been absolutely (laughs) ages and I'm absolutely thrilled to have you back on again. Um, Now, we were chatting at the Independent Midwives Conference just a few weeks ago on our stands, weren't we? And you started telling me about self-efficacy and how you think it's something that pregnant women need to be need to understand and be more aware of and I thought hey that'd be a really great podcast episode so here we are back on the podcast talking about self-efficacy so first of all for anyone listening wondering what on earth is self-efficacy tell us Sophie what is self-efficacy well I started looking into self-efficacy when I was looking for evidence around psychological approaches to antenatal care preparation for childbirth because I'm a clinical hypnotherapist. Hypnotherapy and hypnobirthing is really popular with women, but sometimes gets a really tough time of it because there's not that much evidence around hypnobirthing. Or the evidence that does come out isn't very supportive of it as as an approach. It doesn't show a reduction in epidural rates necessarily. Um, And I've always said people are looking at the wrong outcomes. They're looking at epidural reduction when actually it's not about that. It's about a woman's experience. And so I started looking into more research around fear of childbirth and um, evidence that had been done around that. And I I kind of stumbled on self-efficacy. Um, And I knew about it because, of course, I work as a therapist and I know about Bandura's theory, but I'd never thought that there was all this background of research on self-efficacy in childbirth. And there is loads of it. And so I started reading up on it a bit more. And it's basically a woman's belief in her ability to perform in a way that is successful in terms of her outcome around birth so that she's able to give birth. It's basically the belief that you are able to give birth, that you are able to manage the um, sensations of childbirth, that you're able to manage whatever is thrown your way on that journey. But it's also the belief that any it, whatever you learn and whatever you do, whatever behavior you have, can be really effective. So it, essentially, it's also a woman's belief and a and faith in their ability to perform in that situation. So, so it's so I started looking into that more and more. And um, the factors that underpin it, and the theoretical information that underpins it, is really solid. And I don't think it's just women that need to understand this. I think also professionals need to look more at how psychological therapies can help. Um, improve women's self-efficacy around birth. So basically, it's if a woman just has that low level of confidence and that sense that she just can't do it, that her body can't do it, then she's going to limit her ability to feel that whatever she does can bring about a change. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so low self-efficacy means that women don't believe they can influence the outcome. They don't believe they have the capacity to um, change the outcome. In fact, women with self, low self-efficacy are unable to actually focus on an outcome. They're more they're, they're blocked by the steps they have to overcome before they even reach that outcome. Mm. Whereas women with high self-efficacy, who has really strong belief that yeah, I can do this. Um, I know what to do. I can change it if I need to. Um, she'll be looking at the outcome and thinking that's how it's going to be. She won't be blocked, or she won't see those aspects on her journey as barriers to overcome. Mm. 
And the irony is that if somebody can overcome this, then it will even make her probably, and I don't know if this is a, ter- a phrase that's, that, that exists, but even more self ethic well, I don't know what that word would be, but once you've had an, a, a birth where you have overcome all that stuff, it really powers up your confidence and your ability to think, well, if I've done that, I can do anything. And it really kind of cranks it up a level. But I suppose if you can't even get to that, then you're potentially missing out from a whole ton of stuff in your life, I guess. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, people with who have levels of anxiety or worry before they're even pregnant are more susceptible to having low self-efficacy during birth, um, pregnancy and as they um, get closer to birth. But actually, what you just touched on was really interesting because women who are going through their second birth and second pregnancy often have higher levels of self-efficacy because they know they can do it. And it's women who've had a trauma in the past um, or other aspects, anything else coming in that may cause them to doubt themselves, who have may have, maybe have lower self-efficacy with any subsequent pregnancies. So does that, the second pregnancy, is that reliant on that first birth being a positive experience or will women who even had a difficult one still, will that still empower them in some way and give them confidence that they can? I mean, how does it affect the outcome in terms of what that first birth is like for women? I think there are so many factors influencing that and I would be talking anecdotally rather than research evidence base but um, from the women that I work with women with lower self-efficacy efficacy in a second birth generally have had a traumatic experience first time round, but have recognized they can change things through their um, experiences of talking to other women after the birth so it's not necessarily the birth itself that has influence change but the culture and the environment they're surrounded in as a new mum so it depends it's there are lots of different facets to how a second time mum is influenced to take steps and take changes in a second birth so you can have someone who's had an amazing experience the first time and thinks you know what I am in control of this and I want to make it even better I can do it and they will come on a course or do some psychological work because they recognize that they do have control in changing the outcome. Or you can get women who've had a traumatic experience who want to change it and they know they can by talking to other women who've had more positive experiences. Mm -hmm. Um, But a woman who's had a trauma with their first birth, who has had no positive experiences of talking to other women in those social groups after the birth, um, would be unlikely to seek out psychological care because mm. you know it was there. Mm. Um, so social environment externally and the culture that women are in is as important to a woman's internal environment in making that step to change. And so you talk about sort of speaking to other women and is it necessary for that to be a an actual face-to-face thing or because of the rise of the online communities and, you know, there's so many big Facebook groups now where people are able to share and be very honest in a way that they might not be able to with women in their own community uh, where they live. Will that be a, a good level of support for them and help them or is it really reliant on being face-to-face with somebody? Um there are so many things that can influence a woman's belief in, in, in how she can manage any, her current pregnancy or any future pregnancies. And it can be face-to-face, but it can also be social groups. They're very, very powerful. And what I would say as well is the stru- how, how self-efficacy is structured in terms of theory is really important to understanding that. And I could talk briefly about that. Yes, please. Yes, please. <laughs> so it's about there are four keys to unlocking your self-efficacy and it's about belief behavior action experience essentially but to create that belief which changes your experience um you have to unlock that capacity within you to believe that you can change your outcome and those are performance outcomes so this means that any um, experiences that you have can influence your ability to perform a task in the future. So this is particularly important for second time mums. So if they've performed well at that task before, so they've they've had a great birth before, they've done really well, they've, they've managed it, they've enjoyed it even, they're more likely to feel competent and be able to have a good second birth. 
So that performance, that's, I think that's, that's the challenge with first time mums is they haven't had that experience before. They don't know what to expect. So they don't know how they're going to perform, how they're going to manage that experience, how they're going to respond and react in those moments of the birth. The other one is vicarious experience. And now this one has much more impact on a first time mum. So vicarious experience is witnessing experiences of those around you. So your self-efficacy levels can be determined by what's around you. And that's a lot to do with our culture. So women who are in cultures where um, they are taught to believe they can't do it, that it's dangerous, that um, they need all the help they can get when they see on television horror stories or those women are going to develop a belief that they can't do it that they need help and that's vicarious experience you're learning through others experience of, of what you're filtering in through your culture and your community that's huge isn't it that's it's just huge for birth. absolutely massive for birth and that's what a good psychological class will tackle they'll teach women how their beliefs are formed based on other people's stories, other people's experiences, and how culture, we get stuck in this this cycle in culture because we see those things, we believe those things, we act on those things. And yeah, and yeah, that's unique to Western. I say Western in inverted commas. You know, you go out to somewhere where maybe it's less developed and they're, they're living still with the mothers in the community and they're birthing among female family members. And as far as they're concerned, the, the, the birth is completely doable. It's supported and the woman can do it. And so it really is a very Western thing, isn't it? It's not global by any means. Well, I don't think it's just Western. I think it's there are pockets of different cultures across the world. And um, I think we can't make it a Western thing or an Eastern thing or a developed thing or an underdeveloped thing. I think it's it's very different in many different communities around the world. And it, as, as women feel often very frightened in Western culture, I think women in other cultures as well across the world um, feel very frightened based on their vicarious experiences within their immediate cultural environments. And so I think that vicarious experience is a really important thing to tackle with women. The third one is verbal persuasion. So this is the people around you and how those people can influence you. So either encourage you or discourage you. So it's a bit like you going to someone and saying, right, I'm going to have the home birth because, you know, that's that's what I want. I've decided. And so, oh, you don't want to do that, you know. Yeah. Oh, that's brave. <laughs> and that's encouraging someone. Mm. So that type of verbal persuasion can influence someone's self-efficacy. So the minute someone says to someone, oh, gosh, that's brave, they start thinking, oh, why is that brave? Oh, maybe I shouldn't be thinking like that. Mm. And so you can, so those, and equally, the, the communication a mother has with her medical team, her um, midwife, her obstetrician, um, and that can change things. And often women say to me, oh, I've got a really supportive midwife. She really gets why I'm doing this. And, and that, that midwife is encouraging that woman. She's maintaining that high self-efficacy, that, that belief that she can do this and that her way is the right way for her. Um, whereas another midwife or obstetrician who would say, oh, yeah, I'm not sure about that. Or we'd, we'd rather advise you did this and might actually lower a woman's self-efficacy by causing her to sort of doubt her own beliefs. And so verbal persuasion, really important. And I find this verbal persuasion and the vicarious experience really poignant when I'm teaching hypnobirthing because I know that mums who come into my classes will leave my class thinking, yes, I can do this. And they understand how their beliefs Um, how their beliefs change their behavior and change their action they understand how they can influence and change that they understand what's going on in their body so we've talked about all of their fears and they go out feeling so buoyant strong and then what's going on externally can deflate that a little 
Can I just stop you there and say, I went to one of your classes during my first pregnancy and it was coming out of your class and I went, that's it, I'm having a home birth. So I just (laughs) want to put that out there so that everyone who's listening knows that that's exactly what happens when you go to your class is that you come out feeling completely empowered and there's no way I would have tried. I, yeah, I never even foresaw for a minute that I was going to have a home birth and I made that decision coming out of your class. So I just want to publicly thank you for that, Sophie. Okay. Both of my home births were amazing, absolutely amazing. And I cannot imagine ever wanting to go near a hospital for a birth. I cannot imagine that at all. So just a big thank you to that. <laughs> anyway, back to the podcast. <laughs> you all know from that experience, when you come out of a class where it's not just hitting a birthing, we use mindfulness, we use, we use CBT techniques, we use a bit of NLP, neuro-linguistic programming. We use lots of different psychological techniques. And it's essentially blowing your your belief balloon up. So everything you're given in a class, and you go out with this balloon that's blown up, and you think, yes, it's full of all of that. But every time someone says something or you see something that might conflict with that, it might let a little bit of air out and slowly deflate. So the mother has to keep blowing that balloon up, keep filling it with positive stories, you know, and and keeping that belief buoyant, as it were. So the last thing that women need to look at, and this is slightly different, is physiological feedback. So that's what's going on physically in their body and how they manage physical sensations and interpret those physical sensations so and that can influence efficacy so that um, strong self-belief so um, an easy way to describe that is if you have two people standing at the bottom of a roller coaster and they've both got that churning feeling in the stomach you know the one I'm talking about and and one person said oh I've got those butterflies in my stomach I'm so excited I can't wait to get on that roller coaster and the other person says oh I've got those butterfly feelings as well that churning in my stomach I'm so nervous about going on the roller coaster so those people have had a different physical physiological response um, the same physiological response but they have a different emotional response to it And it's much like birth and how we perceive those sensations of birth and how we're going to, I'm going to use the word cope, even though I don't like to, because that's what a lot lot of women say. How am I going to cope with those, um, with the pain of birth? And that's the, that's a cultural thing. That's a vicarious experience coming in. But really a good psychological class will train a woman or teach women about how she can change her emotional response to what's going on physically in her body and um, you know as well as I do that women because you've had this experience that women come away saying I would not call that painful and they've had a very similar physical experience but their emotional response to it is completely different Mm. so often what a hypnobirthing class is will do that a lot of other antenatal classes won't do is teach a woman techniques to help her change her emotional response to what's going on physically in her body. And that can be through hypnosis techniques, mindfulness techniques, um, all sorts of different things. So she's able to master that experience um, mm. And she's resilient and strong. And she goes in there and says, I've got everything I need within me to make that change. And I think the, I just want to say without that, there's a bit of a loop going on with that, that that what's going on there as well. You know, when you talk about the roller coaster experience, whether that's the pain experience in birth, you know, whenever you have that physical uh, sensation that's happening and then you have then immediately your rational mind or your mind kicks in and then labels that experience and if it labels that as excitement then it kind of then you go oh this is why I'm excited I'm having these feelings I'm excited and it stays in a positive place whereas if suddenly you label it as oh I'm nervous why am I nervous well that's because it's dangerous and I might fall out of the roller coaster da, 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 da. Ooh, and suddenly it sends you down this really negative path and when you think about how that is with pain the psychological response to that physical sensation is absolutely crucial when it comes to birth because if it's pain then you start thinking oh my god pain if I'm going to call it pain pain that must mean that it's bad that must mean I'm in danger oh my goodness then you start fearing it you start worrying it and that really affects the birthing body quite negatively whereas if when you're feeling that sensation and you're not calling it pain you respond differently to it you call it something else you're like 
that means my baby's coming closer. That means I'm breathing it out. Suddenly you're responding. Your body responds in a very different way. And it's like you say, it's the same experience and how that feedback loop kind of supports or de- or, or, or pulls the support from under you. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think this is so true. And women who are listening to this right now and thinking, oh, God, I can't believe they're talking about pain not being, you know, pain it being pain, not being painful and how you can change that because that's a belief right now. If yeah. someone's questioning that, you're, you, you're, you've got to think, I'm questioning that belief. Why am I questioning that? Can I change that? How can I change that? Um, and it's believing that you can change that. That's the important thing. Um, and it's always, if there's a question, it's, can I change it? How can I change it? Of course I can change it. And searching out how you can make those changes. But ultimately, I mean, we're talking about um, sensations and pain of of labour at the moment. But ultimately, this is the challenge that I really find with um, people's preconceptions of what hypnobirthing or what psychological preparation, whether it's mindfulness or whatever is, is that it is about epidural outcomes because that's what the studies are. It's not about that. It's about a woman's experience. And a woman with... Um, it's true that a woman with high, higher self-efficacy and a lower fear of childbirth, because we know that women who have high self-efficacy have a lower fear of childbirth, evidence shows that, um, are less likely to want a cesarean section. But um, it's all about giving women the tools to have a positive experience, however their, whatever their outcome is. And um, I think that's largely overlooked when it comes to psychological preparation. And it's so important because if a woman has higher self-efficacy, we know that high self-efficacy leads to a more positive experience. Um, And if a woman has a positive experience, she's less likely and she's at lower risk of postnatal depression, lower risk of um, trauma around birth. Um, It increases rates of breastfeeding. Um, because there's lower stress and anxiety. Um, And the other element, which is really fascinating, is if you train a partner and if the woman is confident that her partner knows what to do during birth and how to support her, her self-efficacy goes up. So confidence in your birth partner actually improves your your belief in your ability to birth as well, which I think is really interesting. Mm. Well, there's, I read some interesting research or um, work done by, I can't remember who it's now, where the ba- your baby knows whether you feel whether you can do it and can pick up on whether you trust your own body as well and whether you trust your baby to birth themselves. And that's when I read about that, that's a really interesting angle that that I, that I think, again, it isn't considered the fact that your baby is a human being yes they're just inside of you still but that doesn't take away any of their capacity and their emotional capacity and what they can see feel here and you know to consider whether you trust that your baby's going to get into a good position whether you trust your baby can birth itself safely and and all those things so I think you know to treat the pregnant woman in isolation without the bigger picture of her partner her baby is 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 really missing a few tricks I think for positive birth experiences yeah and I think that when women have higher anxiety levels and they they have lower self-efficacy, it's harder to make that connection or that link mm. to the baby as well. Mm. You know, there was there was a great study done. It's moving moving away a little bit. There was a great study done in 2014 by Haynes, which showed that women who had a kind of laissez-faire attitude and were like, oh yeah, I can do it, but didn't prepare anything. Um, had the same um, outcomes in terms of analgesia, cesarean, as women who were frightened of childbirth. Wow. But the who'd, who'd really believed that they could do it and could make a change and actively prepared antenatally and did that psychological work, but also did a lot of work around connection with the baby in the womb, um, they had much better birth outcomes. So let me just get that right. So basically you're saying that the women that wing it, that basically kind of don't prepare at all, think oh, I'm just going to turn up on the day and birth my baby, have yeah. the same outcomes as somebody who's fearful of birth. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So self-efficacy, a high self-efficacy is encourages women that they believe they can do something, they can change that outcome, they can make it what they want. 
they're more likely to experience a more positive birth. Mm. What about those women then that have low self-efficacy that are that don't see a way that they can have any influence on the outcome? How can we move those women into a you know even move them a little bit along that scale to a place where they can see a way forward and start being able to affect their outcome in a more positive way what what can we do to help those women what do they need to think about looking at well I think for those women the first point of call is often their midwife or their doctor um, or their caregiver and they are for women who have low it's another interesting thing that comes out in the research is that women who will have low self-efficacy and who are at higher risk of postnatal depression generally book themselves in very early for their first booking appointment. So that's wow. quite an interesting indicator. Um, and midwives and doctors should be able to pick up on a woman who has low self-efficacy because um, she'll be naturally quite anxious. Women who have low self-efficacy have higher rates of fear of childbirth. Um, so you can identify those women quite easily in a clinical setting. And we know that some of some of the research shows that up to four in five women have anxiety around giving birth. Mm. And so only the most severely tocophobic, that's having a, a fear of phobia of pregnancy, get referred for psychological care. The other women just fall through the net. And certainly in the UK, um, lots of trusts don't refer privately. Lots of hospitals don't refer to private psychological practitioners to counsellors, hypnotherapists. Um, and I know that as a as a as a someone who's been practicing for over ten years, my local hospital won't tell women that I even exist in the local area. Wow. And I don't know how that's different in the States, but I think that's a real block. I think there are a lot of people within the community, not just therapists and counsellors, but also um groups like the positive birth movement and those sort of informal groups are very powerful in supporting women and increasing their self-belief and so I really think that care providers within a clinical sort of setting if they recognize that a woman is anxious should be able to um, to signpost and refer women to services that are private or voluntary within the local community and I think that's I think the problem around that is lack of evidence in in those psychological therapies. So I think we've got so far in in terms of evidence showing how self-efficacy influences birth outcomes, but there's very limited evidence to show how psychological support improves those outcomes within an antenatal setting. There are very few studies, and I think that's a that's a challenge. So what about for the the pregnant woman listening? You know, it's, it's easy. You, you mentioned some ways that maybe in a clinical setting they can be identified. But what about if there's someone listening now? Yeah. Will, will she be able to, will she be listening to this and going, oh, that's me? Or will low self-efficacy kind of mean that she's probably not even listening to the podcast? So maybe she's not even seeking out information yeah. and you maybe know. actually listens to the podcast. They're just generally women with high self-efficacy. I don't know. What's your view on that? I think you're spot on. I think your podcast is called Fear Free Childbirth. And and so I think some women will listen to it. Some women will listen to it and think, oh, no, that's not for me. I, I don't think I can change the outcome. I don't think I've got the power to do that. Um, other women will listen to it and think, you know what? This is the light bulb moment. This is it. I'm going to start researching how I can change my birth. And I'm going to look at how my psychology affects what's going on for me physically and how that's going to change my experience and prepare me for those early early few weeks especially and but there are other women who just won't listen to it mm. and I think they're the women that for years I've been trying to reach and that's partly why I set up a one-day course um, made it more evidence-based because I wanted to reach those women that thought the psychological stuff was a bit airy-fairy and a bit out there well when in fact it's not it's it's integral to a woman's experience of birth so um, I think that is a challenge for people to to capture those women mm. who who um, are just like sheep really I'm sorry and I was one of them 
I was one of them with my first birth. I went to the system, I listened to my midwife, I didn't, I had blinkers on and I was like a sheep. And it's how you, you reach those women, I think, is, is the challenge. And I was one of them, so I should know, but I haven't, I haven't got the answer, sadly. Mm. I just keep on trying to get the message out there and hope someone will pick up on it mm. and tell someone, maybe. It was my mum who told me. And my mum said to me, Sophie, you've got to watch this show on television right now. And I was at the TV with my remote control. And I switched it on because I was there and it was easy. And I just was like, wow, I want some of that. What show were you watching? It was, oh, it was a chat show in the UK called Richard and Judy that was hugely <laughs> popular. <laughs> and um, they were talking about hypnobirthing. And I would never have picked it up if I didn't happen to be there at that moment with my mum on one phone and the remote control in another. Yeah. So in many ways, it was chance. And I was yeah. in the right place at the right time. Mm. I think that, that mirrors my, not mirrors my experience, but certainly when I was in my first trimester of my first pregnancy, I was completely terrified and I was going to have, the, I was planning on the C-section or at least every drug under the sun. And, and I happened to be training in one of my therapies at the time. And somebody said, hey, you know, you can have a pain-free birth. And I was like, you what? Are you like, like BSing me here? What do you mean? And she goes, I'm without drugs. And it is a complete revelation. I didn't realise that that was actually a possible thing that could exist, that painful birth, well, birth, I just thought birth was painful, end off. You know, I didn't realise there was another possibility. And that's when she said, oh, yeah, look, check out hypnobirthing. So that's when I started my journey. But at least coming into that, and I was in my mid-30s at that point, how had I missed all this stuff exactly. for so long? And yet I knew that I was tocophobic. I, I was really avoiding the whole kiddie thing, the whole, I didn't realise I was tocophobic at the time. I wouldn't have put a label on it because I was just so well avoiding it you know but how did I miss all this stuff around birth I was basically just picking up all that vicarious stuff that you were talking about through culture through headlines through what you see on tv that led me to think that birth is this awful thing that I just had to fear and yeah you know breaking through to those women is is not obviously easy I mean I managed to miss out for 15 years of being an adult woman of that stuff you know it's not obvious is it it's not. And the, the, I suppose for me, the most frustrating thing is this is a well, this is a tried and tested um, framework, psychological framework for influencing health behavior. It's used not just, it's not just childbirth self-efficacy that they've developed. Um, they've, this is something called the Childbirth Self-Efficacy Index. There's a, there's a structure for it to measure self-efficacy in childbirth but it's across all sorts of other areas of of health behavior how decisions are made how people respond to information that they're given um, how people assess risks all those sorts of things based mm -hmm. on self-efficacy it's so well evidence-based and recognized yet isn't I, I haven't spotted very much at all in the research that I in the, in the literature that I read um, or the conferences I've been to that talk about and talk about this. So what about those women then listening who are who are self? What's the word if they have self-efficacy? Is that how you say it? They, they yeah, they have it. Um, and they're planning on being pregnant. They, they kind of I get a lot of listeners that are literally preparing and they're trying to conceive and they're going through that. They're, they're at that point in their life and they're kind of, yep, yeah, OK, I'm up for it. What do I need to do? Well, how would you recommend a woman prepare to sort of really max out her self-efficacy to the max uh, even before she's pregnant and prepare for that positive birth? Find local groups um, that you can go and start attending the minute you're pregnant. So um, surround yourself with pregnant, um, other pregnant women who think very positively. Um, I would change my filters on Facebook. I'd subscribe to things on Facebook that are naturally very positive around birth. Um, I'd get a nice library. I'd start reading now. So a whole list of fantastic books um, that, by Ina Mae Gaskin. Um, there's some great books, certainly in the UK, like the... Um, by Sheila Byram. Um, there's a positive birth book which is coming out next year. Um, there's hypnobirthing books. So really reading up around those aspects. But I listened to my MP3s. Um, I had hypno um, hypnotherapy MP3s and I listened to them from when I was about 10, 15 weeks pregnant, very early on. 
And I loved them. I slept really well. And it conditioned me to think really positively about my experience. Um, so I was, my belief was so deeply ingrained that my behavior changed automatically. Um, I wasn't even aware of how much my behavior had changed and how that had influenced my actions. It was such an unconscious thing because I'd started so early. And I remember my waters breaking and they did break quite early, about 33 weeks. And the me before I'd done all of that would have been, oh my God, we've got to get to the hospital now. Rah, rah, rah. But and I, it was like I was on this unconscious autopilot and I was thinking, right, one o'clock in the morning, baby's moving, let my husband sleep, you know, he'll need his sleep. And I kept getting up and down, thinking, yeah. And then about 5.30, 6 o'clock, I woke him up and said, I think we just need to go and get this checked. And he went, why did you wake me? Why did you wake me? And I was like, I don't know. Everything feels fine. I feel fine. Everything's just a little bit of water. He's like, we got 33 weeks. And I was like, yeah, but everything seems fine. It's not, you know, there's not, no signs that anything's really wrong. And um, I was so calm. And he said, I don't know. I, I just didn't think it was you. <laughs> Because I had changed in how I'd responded so much by so the preparation I'd done from very, very early on. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I had a very positive experience. He was born fine. I had a VBAC and I was discharged from the hospital with six days with established feeding. So I really, I believe, this is my belief, that the work that I did very early on really helped condition and program me so deeply and I was just so in touch and with my body and I trusted my body and um even now you know even though he was 33 weeks I say well that happened for a reason and you know whatever was going on my body did that in that moment and so I think for women that are at that point very early on I think it's get don't wait until later on in the pregnancy get stuck in um, it's good fun the practice the more you do the more you uh, the more you um, unconsciously um, make those changes internally that prepare you psychologically um, and I would say as well do a class um, I know there's all these online classes now and um, lots of great audio programs but I I think that's the one thing I regret not doing as a class I think it really brings the techniques alive you meet other women who have those beliefs as well so it reinforces your belief you have someone there um, to help you a practitioner who's always there to help support you and buoy you up if anything brings you down and you can ask questions in a class and it's about processing and so much processing goes on during pregnancy psychologically and I think it's good to be in a physical space with other people, with a professional, to do that. Um, so I think, if possible, really try and attend a course. But that's my personal experience. Other people would say, you know, I felt great just doing an audio or doing a class. And I think for people that have higher self-efficacy, who have more confidence and more self-belief that they can do it, a book and CDs um, may be sufficient but for someone who is really quite frightened and really very anxious and has specific fears like needle phobias things like that actually seeing a practitioner or doing a class is definitely worth it well thank you so much Sophie for talking about the self-efficacy thing which uh, it was a very new concept I'd not really uh, come across but it makes so much sense is there anything else about self-efficacy that that needs to be said before we wrap up? Is there anything I've not asked you that you think, oh God, I really wanted to say this? No, I think Google it. <laughs> just, <laughs> just go and look at childbirth self-efficacy and birth outcomes and you'll see the evidence out there. You'll yeah. see that the evidence is there. You know, it's recognising how important psychological preparation is in, in preparing for childbirth. You know, we look at this Cartesian model of, um, of medicine and actually, we need to be looking at it combined. We shouldn't be separating the physiological from the psychological. We should be doing it all. And women should understand what's happening in their body. And they should know why it's happening and that it is okay. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Sophie. Now, um, 
just so that people can find out more about you, just share, you know, share your website and your book and all the latest stuff that's happening in your world as well. So people can check out. I know you've been recording an audio version of your book, haven't you? So tell us, when's all that happening? Well, um, Mindful Hit Rebirthing has now sold nearly 15,000 copies. Wow. Which is it's coming out officially in the States in February 2017. Oh, brilliant. And an audio book, Penguin Random House have recorded an audio book, which is read by me. Um, Lovely. Much slower and very softly. It's in my hypnotherapy voice all the way through with some great additional meditations. Um, there's a lot of material on there. And that's coming out in February as well across the world. Amazing. Amazing. Well, that is fantastic. And where can they find you online? Where's your, what's your web address? Just let everyone know quickly mindfulhypnobirthing.com perfect perfect well thank you so much once again so for coming up back on the fear free childbirth podcast bye Lexi. you've just been listening to me alexia leachman here on the fear free childbirth podcast thank you so much for tuning in now this is just a wee reminder that if you'd like to listen to bonus podcast episodes and have access to loads of birth preparation downloads my video mini series on reducing your fears and so much more then join the fearless mamaship community today you can join at fearfreechildbirth.com until next time bye for now